uh, Philip Griffiths will speak on monthly pay creep and domain. Thank you. Uh, the topic Mumford Tate groups uh, and Mumford Tate domains have their origins in Hodge theory. Mumford Tate groups are the basic symmetry groups of Hodge theory. Uh, they encode the rational structure and the Hodge structure on vector spaces. I'll explain the definitions in a moment. Uh, Mumford Tate domains. Uh, parameterize uh, families of their universal parameter spaces for families of polarized Hodge structure whose generic point has a given Mumford Tate group. So you think of it as families of Hodge structures with a uh, Mumford Tate group being a generic one. The Mumford Tate groups were introduced in two short papers by Mumford in the mid 1960s. Uh, the stated purpose in those papers was to interpret and to extend uh, some work of Shimura, Kuga, and others on uh, what now are special cases of the complex points of Shimura varieties. Uh, Mumford-Tate domains, when factored by arithmetic groups in the classical case of Hodge structures of weight one, meaning abelian varieties, are exactly the complex points of Shimura varieties. Uh, this is what Mumford was interested in, and uh, uh, you know I think that anyway this was the start of the subject. The basic definitions and the way in which Mumford Tate groups are formulated, uh, I think, date to papers of Deline uh, in the early 70s and afterward in his treatment of Shimura varieties and his work on absolute Hodge cycles and so on. Uh, I think it's fair to say that almost all of the interest in Mumford-Tate groups over the years has been in the weight one case, the classical case of Hodge structures of weight one or if you like abelian varieties up to isogeny. Uh, they, they can be defined in higher weight case and there's been occasional uh, uses of those, for example, in the work of Chad Schoen, but generally the main interest has been uh, the weight one case. I think recently there has become renewed interest in the higher weight uh, case uh, from several sources. One is some questions in algebraic geometry. Uh, second is representation theory, uh, both finite dimensional and infinite dimensional. And the third is the geometry of complex homogeneous manifolds. It's those two topics that will be the main topics of the talk today. Uh, the fourth is arithmetic questions, uh, which I may mention briefly and which I know, uh, know less about. The outline of the talk, I'll first define Mumford tape groups and give their basic properties. Uh, then I'll discuss what are, will be defined to be Hodge representations and give the basic results and especially the classification of those. Uh, the third will be some examples. I'll discuss G2 and the adjoint representation. Uh, the fourth will be Mumford-Tate domains and Hodge domains to be defined again. And then, time permitted, something about complex multiplication uh, Hodge structures. There's some notes that I made, which I'll pass out at the end uh, for the talk today, that has in them the various tables and things like that. Uh, they can be uh, also gotten from Michelle Huguenin uh, over in Fold Hall. Uh, she can send you the PDF. And there's a manuscript that will appear in Annals of Mass Studies. It's joint work with Mark Green and Matt Kerr that's available on Matt's website that's given there. The basic questions that uh, I want to take up, of the first one is which uh, reductive Q algebraic groups can occur as Mumford-Tate groups of a polarized Hodge structure? And the second question, 
passing from the group for the moment to its Lie algebra, uh, for which Lie algebras, well, uh, for, for the Lie algebra of such a group, what are the different ways that it can be realized as a mumford tate group? Turns out that's a more interesting and more fundamental question. It's not which groups occur, but rather given a, a Q algebraic group, in how many ways can it occur? The empty set is when it doesn't occur. And the third uh, question, which is the most subtle of them all, is if you have a, a given <coughs> uh, Lie algebra, there will be a finite number of algebraic groups. We're talking now about semi-simple ones with, for the moment with that Lie algebra. And you want to know which among those admit faithful representations as Mumford-Tate groups. So you can actually realize it. So the, uh, so those are the questions, and what was behind that? Yeah, the out. The general notations that I will use, uh, V will always be a vector space over Q, rational vector space, and for any field containing Q, V sub K will just be this. G will be a Q algebraic group. And for any field containing Q, you can talk about the group of its k-valued points. And for the reals and complexes, there's an associated Lie group, and those will be the notations for it. Okay. Some special groups that uh, will be used are these algebraic groups over Q, uh, just two by two matrices. Uh, the first one is a sort of unitary group over Q. The second is, um, uh, well, it's, it's what, this is what it is. And the third is a multiplicative group. And over here, I've listed the R and C valued points as the Lie groups of those three groups. So we're really talking about the circle and various uh, Lie groups that are, if you like, enlargements of the circle. So the first definition is of a Hodge structure. It is given by a rational vector space <coughs> and a map phi, phi tilde, where phi tilde is a homomorphism of the R valued points of S into GL VR. So it's given by a rational vector space together with uh, a homomorphism into uh, GL VR such that the weight homomorphism uh, is defined over Q. By the weight homomorphism, I mean you take this map here and you restrict it to the multiplicative subgroup, and that should be defined over Q. So in simple language, what the vector space will decompose as a direct sum of vector spaces of different weights, where the weight me weight n means that the weight homomorphism on this matrix is just a to the n times the identity. So your vector space over Q will be a direct sum of vector spaces of different weights. And on each weight part, on each particular weight part, as I'll explain in just a minute, you have a Hodge decomposition. And I'll explain how that comes about in just a minute. So this will be so-called pure weight N. So in general, the space is VPQ. This is the eigenspace 
the C tilde eigenspace for z to the p, w to the q. In other words, if you go back over uh, to this group and you extend it to the complex point, this middle group is C star cross C star, given in this way. And the, uh, the complexification of the vector space will decompose into eigenspaces. And this is the general definition of VPQ. And the complex vector space is always the direct sum of these over different PQs. If you have pure weight N, then uh, it really suffices to look at phi, which is just the restriction of, uh, of phi tilde to the subgroup U. And then it maps the, uh, the real Lie group, which is just the circle, Here, so if whenever you have a homomorphism of a circle into GL, V, VR, the real points, then when you complexify it, the eigenspaces will be where this operates by Z to the P minus Q, or Z to the P, Z bar to the Q, if you like, on the unit circle. So Mumford's original definition was only in the pure weight case. And he said, take, think of a Hodge structure as a homomorphism uh, defined over Q, uh, well, I'm sorry, as a, as a homomorphism of the circle into GLVR, which when you complexify it, broke into eigenspaces of this type where P plus Q is N. And that's this description, the more familiar description of a Hodge structure. In particular, the Ve operator is just phi of i. We're going to be interested in polarized Hodge structures. All the ones that arise in geometry uh, pretty much are polarizable. And this is a triple where V is as before. So these will have pure weight. Q is a non-degenerate bi bilinear form defined over Q, which is alternating or symmetric depending on the parity of N. This phi is like there, so it gives a Hodge structure. And phi should actually map the circle into the automorphisms of the real vector space that preserve Q. So the additional data is that the circle should preserve this bilinear form. And the uh, Two so-called hodge riemann bilinear relations should be satisfied. Uh, I didn't, I'm not even sure I wrote those down. The important one is that Q of U, uh, the Ve operator on U conjugate, should be positive for, new, uh, for U non-zero. And the way to think of that is that you have a Hodge decomposition. The spaces uh, VPQ and should be uh, orthogonal, except the VPQ and the VQP, the conjugate one, should pair non-degenerately using this form Q. And if you put the right power of I in, it should be positive definite. Okay. So it's a direct sum decomposition of the vector space into conjugate subspaces, which are mutually orthogonal and where a certain Hermitian form is positive definite. 
So the general definition of a Mumford-Tate group associated to a Hodge structure, no polarization, is the smallest Q algebraic group such that the image of this contains the real points. In other words, it should be a Q-algebraic group, and when you go to the reals, then the image should contain the, uh, the circle that gives you the Hodge structure. So that's the way to think about it. So it encodes the Q-structure because it's a Q-algebraic group, and it encodes the Hodge structure because it contains the circle whose eigenspace decomposition gives you the Hodge decomposition. There's what's called the restricted Mumford-Tate group, and I'm just going to denote it by G phi, and I'm going to call it also the Mumford-Tate group because this is the thing you use when you have a polarized Hodge structure. This, in the case of a whole polarized Hodge structure, is simply the, the subgroup of this that preserves the form Q. The difference between these will be that G in the pure weight case, that this will be isogenous to the multiplicative group and the subgroup that preserves this, this uh, form Q. It scales on the multiplicative group part and this is the part, then, that preserves Q, and that's the part we'll be interested in. The Mumford-Tate groups uh, have one basic property. It's a Q-algebraic group, so it's a linear Q-algebraic group. So a natural question is, what are the polynomial equations over Q that define it? Okay. Any Q-algebraic group is defined by polynomial equations over Q, so what are they? And for these, one talks about the so-called Hodge tensors. So if the weight is even, the Hodge classes are simply the stuff that is so-called of type MN and is rational. So if you think of the Hodge decomposition, for example, as V2, 0, as V of weight 2 <coughs> over the complexes, it decomposes as a direct sum of these subspaces. This is the 0, 2 part. It's the conjugate of the 2, 0 part. This is over the complexes. The Hodge classes are the intersection of this stuff with the rational points in the vector space. Okay. So these are the Hodge classes in general. They only exist in even weight, and in the Hodge decomposition, it's the rational classes in the middle. If you think of where this all came from, one thinks of this as something like the second cohomology group of an algebraic surface. And the Hodge classes are then the fundamental classes of the algebraic one cycles, the algebraic curves that lie on the surface. So that was their algebra geometric uh, origin. Okay, it was the, the topological invariants uh, associated to algebraic curves lying on an algebraic surface. One can look in the tensor algebra of the, ve of the vector space 
This is the dual vector space. These are the tensors of type KL, tensor product K-fold of the vector space, L-fold of the dual. So the Hodge classes, uh, yeah. And one can look in particular at the Hodge, the algebra of Hodge classes in the tensor algebra. So you have to think a minute and just trace through the definitions to see that the Hodge classes form a subalgebra of the full tensor algebra. And then the basic property is that G phi is the subgroup of GLV that fixes the Hodge tensors point-wise. It fixes all the Hodge tensors. So that's a set of polynomial equations over Q. The Hodge tensors are subspace defined over Q in the tensor algebra. And for a linear algebraic group to fix all the vectors in a rational subspace, those are polynomial equations over Q. So these are the equations that define the mumford tate group. Should mention here that the polarizing form is a Hodge tensor of type 0, 2. Okay. It's a bilinear form from V cross V to the rational, so it's a, a tensor in the dual of V with itself, and it's a Hodge tensor. That comes out of these uh, Riemann bilinear relations. More generally, if you think algebra geometrically, uh, V is something like the cohomology of an algebraic variety. And then you start taking all the products of the variety with itself and looking at all the algebraic cycles that lie on those products. Those are reflected in the algebra of Hodge tensors. So that's the sort of algebra geometric origin. From this basic property, when you look through the proof, a number of things come out. The first is that the Mumford-Tate group is reductive. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it, it can be characterized alternatively as the subgroup that preserves all sub-Hodge structures in the tensor algebra. Okay, and for each Hodge structure, there'll be an orthogonal one in the polarized polarized case, using the polarizing form. So it's a reductive uh, algebraic group. Okay. Uh, another property that comes out is that if you have a Hodge structure and uh, yeah, if you have a Hodge structure and a map from uh, how to say it? From GLV to the general linear group. This is defined over Q, some V prime. Then you can look at the, this should be tilde, you can look at the Hodge structure you get on V prime by composing the circle mapping in with this representation. <coughs> and the Mumford-Tate groups are functorial in the sense that the image of the Mumford-Tate group here is the one for this induced Hodge structure over here. Other properties, such as the Mumford-Tate group of a product or a direct sum, are a little more subtle, but they can all be worked out. The way that one traditionally went about the first question there, which groups appear as Mumford-Tate groups, was to start with a Hodge structure and working with the Hodge structure, try to figure out 
which groups can appear as Mumford Tate groups. Uh, I think the way we went about it was to invert the question. And given a reductive algebraic group, ask the question, in how many different ways can that group appear as a Mumford-Tate group? So the basic notion here is of a Hodge representation. You should be given a group. How do I write this? So we're given a vector space V and a bilinear form. That's always in the background. The Hodge representation will then be given by the group, uh, a representation and a phi, where rho is a representation on this vector space preserving this bilinear form, and uh, the uh, rho composed with phi uh, gives a polarized Hodge structure. So you need a vector space with a bilinear form and a group, and you ask, when is there a representation of that group in the automorphisms of the vector space preserving the form, and a circle that gives you a polarized Hodge structure? So that's a Hodge representation. And we'll say that the pair G rho leads to a Hodge representation. So here we're just given the vector space V. This leads to a Hodge representation. if there is a Q and a phi such that uh, V, um, I'm sorry, G rho phi is a Hodge representation. In other words, here you're just given a representation of G on a vector space, and it's a Hodge representation if you can find the bilinear form on the vector space and the circle in the real points such that you get a polarized Hodge structure. So the problem then is to classify the pairs G and representations rho that lead to a Hodge representation. So the status of this problem, uh, I'll explain the, the detailed result in a minute, but the status of this problem uh, is, is, you can do by the following picture. So if you look at, so first, uh, it's only been done for semi-simple groups. The full reductive case hasn't been done. And if you look at the picture, that you can reduce yourself as usual to the case basically of simple groups. So let's just look at first the simple Lie algebras. And there's that standard uh, list, the four types and the five exceptional ones. And each of these has a bunch of real forms. And each real form has a whole other bunch of rational forms, that is, Q algebraic groups whose associated real Lie group is one of these. So what has been classified completely are the Hodge represent, the, if you like, the real part of the story. Now, every real form here comes from at least one Q algebraic group over here. 
So to answer the question, uh, the original question, you look at the list of all the, the simple Q algebraic groups. That's a complicated story. And if it, look at the corresponding real Lie group, and if it appears in the list that the classification theorem gives you, then it's a Mumford-Tate group. Okay. And more subtly, it's not just the groups, but it's actually the representations classified by the highest weight here, and then the highest weight plus some additional data here. And that list is the one that's known. Um, one general property, I guess I can. Well, I think I'll come, come back to that in a minute. That deals with the adjoint representation. So the general properties of uh, groups of, of what are going to be Mumford-Tate groups are as follows. So it's the following theorem. Suppose that G has a Hodge representation. So it's a semi-simple now Q algebraic group. Then uh, the associated real group, so this is a real semi-simple Lie group. G could be simple, and this may be only semi-simple. Okay, in fact, that happens frequently. But this is, in any case, semi-simple. It contains a compact maximal torus. So already that's a significant restriction on the group. If you look at the A series, the ANs, it rules out A n bigger than or equal to 3. The second part is that the uh, subgroup of the real Lie group that preserves the polarized Hodge structure it is compact. And in fact, it's the centralizer of the circle. Okay. So to preserve the Hodge structure, you have this real Lie group operating on the vector space. The vector space complexified has been decomposed into a, its Hodge PQ components, and you're looking at the subgroup of the real Lie group that preserves that decomposition to, into the real pieces. So here what you do is you combine VPQ and VQP. This is a vector space and it's conjugate, and you take the real points. And that decomposition of the real vector space should be preserved. That's the definition of what this means that preserves the polarized Hodge structure, the corresponding decomposition into real parts. So the example I gave a minute ago, you decompose to 0, and it's conjugate, the 0, 2 part. You take the real part of that, and then the 1, 1 part, the real part of that, and you should, it should preserve this. And the third part of the theorem is that if GR, OK, 
contains a compact maximal torus that implies that the adjoint representation so you look on the Rayleigh algebra at the Carton killing form uh, has a Hodge representation so I'll put it this way <coughs> that add from G into the automorphisms of the Lie algebra preserving the Carton killing form leads to a Hodge representation. So if you look at the adjoint group, the group modulo at center, uh, then that's a Bumford Tate group. <coughs> this means that there's a circle in the real point that gives you a polarized Hodge structure, in fact, of weight zero on the Lie algebra with the bilinear form being the carton killing form. So this is a weight, this will be a weight zero polarized Hodge structure. And the Q, which is B, is symmetric. So up to finite groups, uh, this tells you which um, Q algebraic groups can be Mumford Tate groups. Yeah? Is G independent of what? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, this should be a new theorem. Yeah, sorry. So these are, if you have a Hodge representation, then this happens. Now, if converse, it's the converse to this, that if you contains a compact maximal torus, then the adjoint representation is a Hodge representation. Thank you. So I wrote over here uh, the list of the simple Lie algebras which satisfy these conditions. So that's the list of the Lie algebras of Mumford-Tate groups. More interesting list, which is in the notes, is the list of the Lie algebras of Mumford-Tate groups of odd-weight polarized Hodge structures. For many sort of geometric reasons, these are, are somewhat more interesting, and it's a much shorter list. So for example, uh, SU21 occurs here, but it does not occur if you restrict yourself to odd-weight. It can only be the Mumford-Tate group of even-weight polarized Hodge structure. So I want to explain uh, now, this is sort of a general structure theorem. I want to go to the question of which representations, given by their highest weight, uh, are Hodge representations. That is, for which representation, irreducible representations can you find the alternating form and the circle giving you a polarized Hodge structure. And this gives uh, the sort of flavor of the arguments that uh, go into the story. They're very much sort of representation theoretic. Just a remark in connection with the um, talks that I gave in, the, uh, in Richard Thomas's seminar, these three mumford tate groups are, again, exactly the reductive Q algebraic groups are the semi-simple Q algebraic groups that admit discrete series representations. So that's one way that sort of representation theory and Hodge theory connect. Yeah. 
So to explain the theorem, I want to use the following notation. This will be the Lie algebra complexified. This will be the Lie algebra of a compact maximal torus. It's usually called H, but in Hodge theory, the H is reserved pretty much universally for something else, so I'll just call it T. So this is a Carton subalgebra. Uh, the compact form, so we'll assume this is a simple complex Lie algebra. The compact form will contain a compact maximal torus, and you have a root lattice contained in a weight lattice. So, for example, the connected uh, real Lie groups with, I call it P prime, the connected real Lie groups uh, whose Lie algebra is a real form of this complex Lie algebra is one of these. These are in one to one correspondence with the lattices between the weight lattice, or the root lattice, and the weight lattice. So the center, this is just to recall the standard sort of classification, is this quotient and the fundamental group is, uh, whoops, yeah. so the finite number, so if what I'm thinking of is a real form of a complex simple Lie algebra. There are a finite number of real forms. The ones that are of interest are listed there. And for each real form in the Lie algebra, there are a finite number of real uh, simple Lie groups with that real Lie algebra. And they're indexed by the lattices that fit between the root and weight lattice. We'll take a Carton decomposition into the Lie algebra of maximal compact subgroup and the orthogonal complement under the killing form, so the non-compact root spaces, and define a homomorphism from the roots into Z mod 2Z by C of a root is zero for alpha compact root and one for alpha non-compact. So you're just keeping track of the compact versus the non-compact roots. This is a homomorphism because the Carton involution is a homomorphism. And define another homomorphism, this time into Z mod 4Z, where you think of this as twice the little c. So what that means is that it's uh, zero for alpha compact and two for alpha non-compact. So the reason uh, for these two different, if you like, uh, uh, parities is that the bilinear form is either even or odd depending on the weight. So the mod two part of the parity of the bilinear form is what this will pick up. And the second hodge riemann bilinear relation is i to the power p minus q, that thing is positive definite, on this pq space in the hodge decomposition. So the second hodge bilinear relation depends on a power of i mod 4, and that's what this, that's how this gets in. Okay. So next we let lambda be a highest weight of uh, of a 
representation rho. You'll have to explain what you mean by this because I'm thinking here of an irreducible representation of a real simple Lie group. And those break up into three types. Uh, namely, when you look at the um, endomorphisms that commute with a group algebra, with a group action, that's a division algebra. So you have three cases, R, C, and Q. I'm sorry, quaternions. So this means that uh, when you uh, complexify the representation, it remains irreducible, and it has the highest weight. In this case, when you complexify it, it reduces into something direct sum, it's contragedient. And there the highest weight is, again, you have a highest weight. And there's a similar story here. So by the highest weight, I mean either the usual highest weight here or the highest weight of one of the two irreducible pieces here. Now, the homomorphism into the real Lie group, you can always map it to uh, the compact maximal torus, which is the Lie algebra divided by the lattice, whichever group you have. So this corresponds to a lattice point. So I'll think of circles in a torus as simply lattice points, meaning is it the obvious thing that you project the real line down, it closes up into a circle. So the basic theorem then is if you look at so L this is in lambda and you can think of it um, as a linear function on the weights. So lambda maps to the homomorphisms of the weights to z, and that maps to the homomorphisms of the roots to z. Usually, you think of roots as linear functions on the uh, Lie algebra of the torus. Here, I'm dualizing it. So I'm thinking of L phi as a linear function here. And let this project to, I'll call it, well, call it L phi tilde. Okay. I got the right theorem. Yeah. So the theorem is that this circle, that there exists a bilinear form, such that the representation space for uh, this highest weight, the bilinear form Q and the circle, gives a polarized Hodge structure if and only if L phi tilde restricted to the roots is C. And then also this implies that L phi tilde on lambda, it's an integer, it's even or odd, depending on Q is symmetric or anti-symmetric. I won't write that out. So the gist of this then is the test for when a circle, for when they're given a circle in T, when is there an invariant form Q such that you get a polarized Hodge structure with that circle. And the test is expressed in terms of the highest weight and the root structure. So this is the 
theorem that allows you, given examples, to simply look at the roots and weights and find out what all the polarized hot structures are. You just, uh, they're in the notes. I did it for G2. You can just list them all. Um, I'm going to run out of time. I wanted to make, I guess, two final comments. The first is about Hodge tensors. Uh, a somewhat surprisingly a long standing question is what does this algebra of Hodge tensors look like? You'd think that people would know the answer. What are the generators and relations? Well, for the adjoint representation, uh, you have two very nice Hodge tensors, the Carton killing form, that's your bilinear form, and the Lie bracket. So the bracket is, so it's a Hodge tensor of type 1, 2. And the theorem is that for the adjoint representation, for any circle any that gives you a polarized Hodge structure, this generates the algebra of Hodge tensors. So for the adjoint representation, it has a nice clean answer. And the last remark I want to make, in the notes, there's a bunch of stuff on Mumford-Tate domains and, and G2, uh, which I don't have time to go into. For G2, uh, there are two very nice Hodge structures for the standard representation. Turns out that there are two very special Hodge structures for this. Uh, one is of weight 2, and it has Hodge numbers H20 is 2, H11 is 3. So it's a seven dimensional vector space. And the other is of weight 4. So this is weight 2. Weight 4, and all the Hodge numbers are 1. Okay. Now, uh, anytime you have a Hodge representation, you get the so-called Mumford-Tate domain. And geometrically what that is, I explained it earlier, it's the set of all polarized Hodge structures of a certain type. You can think of it as a homogeneous space that you get by taking the quotient of this by h phi. And you can think of this as the set of conjugacy classes. Of h phi in g, in the real Lie group. So the standard uh, classical picture for elliptic curves is just the upper half plane or for abelian variety is the Ziegel upper half plane. So this is some homogeneous complex manifold that's like that, but where you're now prescribing what the generic Mumford-Tate group of the polarized Hodge structure should be. This is a homogeneous complex manifold, uh, and it has in it an invariant distribution in the tangent bundle. It's the thing that gives you, whose tangents give you variations of Hodge structure. So going back to these two examples here, uh, 
This is a quotient of G2 by, uh, this is a, turns out it's five dimensional, it's a quotient of G2 by a, a subgroup, a four dimensional real subgroup containing a compact maximal torus. Same thing here. And actually, G2 factored by its maximal torus turns out also to be a Mumford Tate domain. And they're maps like this. In 1905, in one of his most beautiful papers, most difficult paper Carton ever wrote, uh, what he did was study the geometry of five dimensional manifolds having a rank two non integrable distribution and found the complete set of invariants. First, he has to define a geometry. It's like in Riemannian geometry, you have an associated connection that has curvature and so on. You have something like a, 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 a Cartan connection and its invariants. Okay? So, Cartan found. Uh, he, d he did this classification for a field of non-integrable two-plane field on a five-dimensional manifold, and he found two Cartan geometries. These were the first realizations of G2. The flat models, so it's like constant curvature in Riemannian geometry, the two flat models had G2 as symmetry group. It's the first time G2 appeared as a group of transformations. It had appeared as the Lie algebra, and therefore is an abstract group, but never, you'd never seen it as a group of transformations. So these are in Carton's 1905 paper, and then he had what was called a Lee Klein correspondence between the two, where this is G2 by its maximal torus. Okay? So this one is the Mumford Tate domain for this particular Hodge structure, and this one is a Mumford Tate domain for that one. This is a Mumford Tate domain. And one of the, I think, to me, very interesting geometric open questions is once you get into this business, you have all these Mumford-Tate domains and you have these sorts of maps between them. And the algebra geometric and representation theoretic significance of these uh, is really, I think, a very interesting and not really much studied issue. The representation theoretic aspects have been studied some by the Russians, but the sort of Complex geometric <coughs> ones have not. Anyway, uh, although Cartan didn't know Hodge theory, uh, he found these two Mumford Tate domains uh, in 1905. And in fact, his model of this one was very interesting that whenever you have a manifold with a distribution, you can look at integral curves. So those are ordinary curves in the manifold that are tangent to the distribution. This one here, the mechanical model is you have a two-sphere, round two-sphere, rolling without slipping on a round three-sphere, where the ratio of the radii is one to three. <laughs> so this Mumford-Tate domain has a mechanical, if not an algebra geometric interpretation. Thank you. <laughs>